The reading from the book of Judges and this gospel passage from Luke are almost identical. A barren woman, <coughs> no children, no conception, no pregnancy, the apparition of an angel with the promise of life. An angel announcing a child as good news. An angel announcing the end of a curse and the beginning of a blessing. It would be hard to understand at first glance the significance of these readings without realizing what scripture says about barrenness and how the people of the Old Testament and of the New Testament looked at barrenness. They looked at barrenness as a curse, a sign of God's displeasure. No, no children coming out of the womb was something to, that, 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 that the enemies of God, you would wish it on God's enemies, that there be no children in their womb. Barrenness is a curse because God is life. Turn away from God, you turn away from life. And barrenness was a sign that God's favor was not with you. On the other hand, these angels bring good news. And they bring the good news of life. Exactly the same words in both readings, though separated by centuries. You will conceive and bear. You will conceive and bear a child. God brings life. The blessing of God and life are the same thing. In the famous Deuteronomy passage about choosing life, God says, I set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. Choose life, therefore, that you may live. Notice God gives his people the freedom to choose, but he doesn't give them the freedom to determine the consequences of their choice. He doesn't say, I set before you life and curses on the one hand and death and blessings on the other. No, I set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Life goes with blessings, in fact is a blessing, Choosing death goes along with curses. Yeah, you can choose either one, but you can't choose the consequences. The consequences are what they are going to be. So the first, this is the first theme that comes across to us in these readings. But then there is a second, a second one that takes us a level deeper. And that is that in both of these cases, the child to be born is a deliverer. The child to be born is going to have some role in rescuing God's people. So in the case, in the first case, in the book of the Judges, now this is just before the time of the kings. The judges were sort of like very localized kings, military leaders, if you will, who would, when the time came and when the necessity arose, fight against the enemies of God's people in the surrounding uh, territories. Remember, Israel was surrounded by nations that had kings, but they themselves didn't have a king, and eventually they said, we want a king also. But that would come a little bit later. First were the judges. And this was one of the great judges here that is conceived and born, namely Samson. And as the reading says, he grew up, the Lord blessed him, the spirit of the Lord stirred him. He was consecrated to God. Why? He had a special mission for the deliverance of his people. And in the gospel, the same thing is said about John. This is going to be John the baptizer. This is going to be the precursor of Jesus. This is going to be the last and the greatest of all the prophets. This is going to be the one whom Jesus himself called Elijah. He's going to come and prepare the world for the great day of the Lord. He would be consecrated to God. And once again, the same thing is said about this son, 
in the gospel, as is said about Samson in the first reading, namely, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit bringing life, the blessing of life, and raising up a deliverer to set the people free from their enemies. These two readings, obviously, are both pointing to another announcement to come to Mary and to say, you will also bear a son. And again, she doesn't know how because she has resolved not to have any relations with a man. But you will bear a son and he will be the greatest deliverer of all. He will be the greatest rescuer of all because he will save his people, not from the Philistines, not from some kind of invading army. He will save his people from their sins, not from those who want to come and destroy you, but from death itself. He will rescue you. So now we have this pattern. And there's one other profound lesson that we in the pro-life movement need to take from these readings. Both of these individuals, that is, Zechariah while he was ministering in the temple of the Lord, and here the, um, the mother of Samson, have a vision. They have an apparition. They have a supernatural experience. The readings don't say that they sat down and they thought about this or this was the result of their meditation or they decided to write in their journal and they came up with this. They said there was an intervention from God. There was a miraculous moment when they encountered the Lord in an extraordinary way. Not the ordinary way that we encounter Him every day, but these were apparitions, these were supernatural experiences. And yet look at what happens in both of them. The supernatural reality of that encounter with the angel is confirmed by something natural. An angel appearing to us is not an everyday occurrence, and in fact it's not even a once in a lifetime occurrence. It's a once in many lifetimes occurrence. Not many people have this experience. But many people do have the experience of conceiving and bearing a child. The supernatural message is pointing to something on the natural level. In fact, both of these experiences at different times in salvation history. You notice an interesting difference, by the way, between these two very similar stories. And you've got to read them several times to catch all these differences, but in the first case in the first reading when um, when the mother of Samson goes back to her husband and says this this man of God appeared to me she says I did not ask him where he came from nor did he tell me his name now contrast that with the gospel the angel said to Zechariah I am Gabriel angel told him his name and told him where he came from. I stand before God and I was sent to you. I stand in the presence of God. And I was sent to you to give you this good news. Why in the first, I don't know his name, he didn't tell me his name, I didn't ask where he came from. And in the second, the angel says the name and says where he, where he came from. Because we're at a different stage of salvation history. In the Old Testament, the revelation was partial and fragmentary. As the letter of the Hebrews says, God spoke to our fathers in fragmentary and varied ways through the prophets. But now in the fullness of time, the fullness of revelation comes. The doors of the heavens are open. We see the full manifestation of God in Jesus Christ. And so more is forthcoming. The springs of revelation are stronger. The waterfall is more powerful once we get to the New Testament. But in both cases, no matter what phase of salvation history you find yourself, not only is the supernatural revelation confirmed by the natural event of conception and childbirth, but also it is its foundation. Now anybody can come along and say that they had a vision. I never claimed to anybody that I had a vision because I never have. 
I don't know if you've had people come to you and say that they've had visions, but people claim to have visions very a, a, a lot of the time. But how in the world do we know that it's real? Somebody could come along and say, thus says the Lord. Or we hear people say all the time, the Lord told me this and the Lord told me that. <laughs> well, okay, but I don't know. There's got to be some kind of confirmation. And in, in fact, in Scripture we see evidences of what these confirmations are, and the confirmation is very simple. If the prophet who says, thus says the Lord, says something and it doesn't happen, it wasn't the Lord. Whereas if he says, here's what the Lord says is going to happen, and it does happen, guess what? That was the Lord. And so again, the supernatural, the claim to the supernatural visit or appearance, the claim to that is verified by a natural event, the overcoming of the barrenness with fertility. And brothers and sisters, what does this say to us who defend life? First of all, our religion is all about life. Christmas is not just about the birth of a child. It's about the birth of a whole new humanity. Christmas is not just about all the natural virtues that we sing and talk about and celebrate family and unity and fellowship and caring and giving and peace on earth. All of these are natural desires of the human heart and, and, and aspects of natural happiness. And people, many people at this time of year will say, oh, so this is a great time of year and we're celebrating, you know, what God wants us to be. And, and you know, we have to make a commitment to be better people. But the coming of Jesus Christ, the, the incarnation, God becoming one of us, God becoming this little child, is not simply to make us good people. It's to make us new people. Christmas is not just about celebrating the natural virtues. It's about celebrating the fact that we share now in the divine nature. We have supernatural life. Our religion and the reality of Christmas is all about God pouring his life into us. We share our human nature with God through Mary. He shares with us his divine nature through faith and baptism. So now we have a, a religion that's all about life. So it's the foundation. The, 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 the reason why God saves the world through... You ever realize God saves the world through pregnancy and childbirth? He, he brings us salvation in that way. We're about to celebrate the coming of the Savior. Why aren't we about to celebrate the coming of the Savior by saying, oh yeah, the first Christmas, wasn't it wonderful? The sky opened up and there was a big earthquake and down came the King of Kings on a royal throne with millions of angels surrounding him. Why in the world couldn't he have come that way? And the fact of the matter is, he could have. Or, the first Christmas, isn't it marvelous? God prophesied for thousands of years that he was going to come, and then on one day there was a shaking of the earth, and the ocean opened up, and it parted, and there was a big hole in the ground, and up from there in grand and splendor glory rose the king of kings. Why didn't he do it that way? Or, oh, there appeared a man in the middle of the city, and it was at the entrance of the palace, and he was dressed in bright robes, and nobody could look. We could write the scripture ourselves. Nobody could look at it, and the eyes of those who dared to look at it were burned out of their sockets. You can imagine what the reading would sound like. And there was music, and there were trumpets that were blaring. Why couldn't he have come that way? These would all be supernatural phenomena, brothers and sisters. And God, he can do all kinds of supernatural phenomena, but he decides not to. He uses childbirth. He uses pregnancy. He uses a womb. He uses an embryo. He uses a zygote. He uses a fetus to save the world. And you know what? God doesn't change. He didn't change from the time of Samson to the time of Zechariah, and he didn't change from the time of Jesus Christ to 2014. He didn't change because he doesn't change, because he's not going to change, because he still uses pregnancy and childbirth to save the world. And barrenness is still a curse. And the blessing of life is still a blessing. And salvation will not come 
if we can't welcome the child, and humanity would not survive if we keep throwing the child away. This is what we take from these readings and from this feast of Christmas. We don't need an angel to tell us to defend life. We don't even need this to tell us to defend life. You know what we need? All we need is this, our own humanity. Are we alive? Is that good? Do we have a body? Are we human? That's all you need. You don't need any authorization to defend life. You don't need any commendation to defend life. You don't need anybody praising you to defend life. You don't need anybody paying you to defend life. You don't need anybody patting you on the back to defend life. You don't need anybody doing anything to you to defend life. As a matter of fact, if the whole world is set against you, you defend life. And if a million people come to you and say you should be doing something else, you defend life. And if a million people come to you with a million other issues and say, oh, but this is the most important thing, and that's the most important thing, and the other thing is the most important thing, you defend life. Because you know what? That thing and that thing and that other thing aren't going to be things at all without life. We are very much involved in the battle for religious freedom. We are very much involved in encouraging all those who are fighting for the defense of marriage. But you can't be religious, and you can't be free, and you can't be married if you aren't alive. If you aren't born, you can't enjoy your religious freedom. If you aren't born, you can't enjoy that loving union of husband and wife, which is the image of God himself. No, the scriptures are clear. Even supernatural revelations, even the reality of the incarnation, the very action of God marrying humanity to himself, it revolves around, it points to, it's based on, it's founded upon pregnancy and childbirth. Brothers and sisters, Pope John Paul II said to Father Paul Marx, and he said to me, that this is the most important work on earth. We don't believe that because a pope said it, however. We believe it because human reason says it. We believe it because you don't have to believe it. Abortion isn't wrong because the Catholic Church says so. It's the other way around. The Catholic Church says so because it's wrong. And if an angel from heaven appeared and told us that it wasn't, or if a scripture passage were discovered that said that it wasn't, well then that's not scripture and that's not an angel. And we don't believe it. If a church arises and says that it's not wrong. That's not a church. And if a church that is a church starts saying it, it ceases to be a church. Brothers and sisters, I don't know how many different ways we can say it, but we're going to keep coming up with more ways of saying it. There is nothing more fundamental, there is nothing more urgent than the work in which we are engaged. And I don't care if we have to stand in front of tanks in the middle of the city square. Tanks! We will stand in front of them to defend life. We will hold up the unborn children and we will say, every nation in the world, come and rally against us. We defend life. Now that brings us, of course, to... I never give a, a, one of these Advent homilies or a Christmas homily without talking about some of the Christmas carols. The Christmas hymns that carry such rich messages. There's so many great theological Christmas hymns. Some of them are, are, are better than even a lot of these passages that we read from the scriptures. And the deeper you go into the verses of the Christmas hymns, the more theology and the more doctrine and the more catechesis you get, the more inspiration you get. You would go sing the third and the fourth and the fifth verse. Of course, other Christmas hymns aren't so theological, like Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer, <laughs> or I Saw Mommy Kissing Santa Claus. Oh, yeah, that's right. Dominic the Donkey. I haven't heard that one in a while. But then, of course, so many of them are. And the one I always love to talk about, write about, preach about, and remind pro-lifers about is one verse of one popular Christmas hymn 
that we really take as an anthem of our movement. And you know who else did the same? The abolitionists. The abolitionists took this particular verse of this particular Christmas hymn and they used it as an encouragement for their movement. And so we must use it also as an encouragement for ours. And we do. Because it reminds us of this fundamental theme of Christmas that the fact that God became human means that humanity is raised up and cannot be oppressed, cannot be canceled out, cannot be trampled down. Because now Christmas means in welcoming the child, we welcome everyone whom he loves and everyone whom he made. We welcome everyone he welcomes. If we reject a single human life, if we deny anyone his or her human rights, we're not welcoming that child. So Christmas, as a tremendous blessing, brings an awesome obligation. Welcoming the child, to welcome all the child in welcoming the head, to welcome the members, in welcoming the creator, to welcome the creation. And therefore we sing, Truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. Change shall he break, for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. O oh, holy night, it is approaching. And it is approaching because the day is approaching. And it is approaching because the light is approaching to conquer the darkness. And it is approaching so that we can go into that darkness and proclaim life over death and fertility over barrenness so that we can proclaim the child who is our salvation. Amen.